I still feel sick to my stomach, and I am honestly so freaked out right now I have every light on in the house. I volunteer for a 24-7 wildlife rescue service here in Australia that mostly accounts to picking up orphaned joeys from the side of the road, catching sick wallabies and roos, getting possums out of fireplaces and others ranging from very challenging to the basic. Now I don't drive, so I only do rescues in my area or in a relatively nearby suburbs. I live a block away from a wildlife reserve that has a problem with toxoplasmosis, a parasite that is basically deadly to most macropods, or animals with pouches and marsupials. So when there was a call out at 9pm in the reserve right next to me for a medium-sized wallaby with toxo, I had been bored all day on my day off and went, heck, why not? Got my recuse tab, which contains my essentials, hessian bag, ties, gloves, and head torch, and went on my way. The couple that called in the roo were at the entrance of the trail and they told me where it was. I knew them. Our dogs liked to play together and I was easily able to understand what part of the track they were talking about and I trust them. They offered to come with me but it was cold and late and I didn't want to stress the little guy out by having so many people around it. So I politely said no and that I got this. My area is very safe and I've had no problems walking out late at night or in the dark. So I walked the 30 minutes uphill into the reserve and found the poor wallaby. He was so lethargic he didn't bother to move when I went right up to him. Now, he was a very large wallaby, definitely not a medium and probably weighed around 45 kilos more than half my own body weight. I normally wouldn't do these rescues because I know it pushes my physical capabilities. So I gently maneuver him into the sack I had in my tub tie it such with some cable ties and pop him in the tub. Now having grown up in the area in the Australian bush, I am very very used to the sounds of the animals in the night, the scratching, movements, hissing, growling, etc. And since I had my head torch on the entire time I could see where my feet were going, I was fine. You develop a sixth sense of sorts. I knew the sounds so well, I was a nighttime bush tour guide a few years ago before I got sick. And when I get a hair-raising feeling on the back of my neck, I know something isn't right. And as sure as sure, every hair on my body seemed to stand on end. I am on the balls of my feet and I scan the surrounding area, thinking it might be a snake or a lost dog or something. Nothing. Confused but still trusting my gut, I slowly start to travel back down the trail. The wallaby is too heavy, I have to stop every few meters and put it down to stop the tub from cutting my hands. Then there was a large crack in movement to my rear left. I spin around and start internally freaking out. That was no animal sound I knew. It had to be a person. It was way way too big and there was a sudden silence like whatever had made the noise had stopped or was stalking. I decided to just screw it. Pulled on my gloves, hoisted the wallaby over my back, turned off my light and started booking it down the trail, sticking to the right side just along the edge of the trees, leaving my tub behind. I doubt anyone would take it and honestly, I was freaking out so much I couldn't care less. Luckily it was mostly downhill so I got out of there in maybe 20 minutes or so. Every now and then I could hear a distinctive rustle or crunching of dead bark on the ground and that was way too big for any animal in my area, let alone one that would follow a human. The entire time my instincts are screaming to run, run, run. I was gripping the bag over my shoulder for dear life and didn't even stop when my shoulder was screaming to stop and rest. I made it out and down several streets, well into the tight-knit neighborhood and into the light before I dared stop. I couldn't bring myself to look over my shoulder. I could feel someone watching me. I started to cry as I made my way home only a few streets away. I told my mom and she looked very worried and lightly scolded me for going out like that, even though we have both done this kind of thing before. I called up my best friend and she came over for the night and to come with me to try and find my rescue tub with me the next day. This morning another rescuer came to take the sick route to the vet and me and Risa went back up to the bush. We found it. 
The heavy-duty plastic tub had been smashed up, like something kept jumping on it. It was half intact. There were butts of what I could only assume were rolled up cigarettes and a needle empty on the ground. I just silently picked up my broken tub and threw it away when I got home. I don't think I will ever be going out at night for a long, long while. I had just finished high school and had recently turned 18 when all of this occurred. I was looking forward to starting university and was going to be moving out of my parents' house into student housing closer to campus. As a result, I started looking for a job closer to my residence. I found one about five minutes walk from where I was going to be living and it was perfect for me. I was to be a barista in a tiny little coffee kiosk on one of the coolest streets in the city. The street was sort of known for ladies of the night and certain illicit substances, but it was also super popular as it hosted some of the most interesting events and also contained some of the nicest thrift stores in the city. What was even more ideal about my new job was the fact that I worked right across from the road from my best friend, we'll call her Phoebe. At the time, Phoebe was in love with her job. She was actively being given more responsibilities and she was being promised the world by her employers. Many of these promises turned out to be false at the time, but that's another story. During one of her shifts, Phoebe was approached by a man who had seemingly become a regular at the place that she was working. We'll call him Richard. He told her that if she ever wanted to leave her job, he had just become the manager of a new restaurant a little ways down the road. Phoebe kindly denied his offer. He approached her several more times with the same offer before she recommended him our other close friend. We'll call her Mia. Mia was hesitant to take the position at first because she has a passionate hatred for hospitality and greatly prefers retail, but she needed the extra money at the time and she took the job. The day that Mia was signing her contract, Phoebe and I both finished work early at around 4, so we told Mia that we would meet her at her new job once we finished and then we would go do something afterward. Phoebe and I went to the cake shop next door and sat outside her work while we waited for Mia. When they finished, Richard followed Mia outside to come say hi to Phoebe. The girls introduced him to me and conversation ensued. He seemed like a friendly guy, if not a little bit awkward. He was late 30s, early 40s, bird-like in appearance, quite short, balding, large in size, and seemed very greasy. As the conversation continued, I began to tease Mia a little bit as friends do. I saw no harm in it as she was one of my best friends and she had made a similar joke at my expense prior to this interaction. Richard's demeanor suddenly seemed to switch. He became somewhat catty in defense of Mia. He retorted back that if I was going to be mean to his staff that he would bar me from every store in the street we worked on. This seemed ridiculous but he claimed to be friends with a security guard that worked on the street. I actually was friends with this man and when I asked him about it, he told me he had never heard of Richard before. Richard said these things to me as though he was joking, but he was so persistent about it that I got incredibly uncomfortable and actually wanted to cry. It was from this interaction that he nicknamed me Trouble. I also feel it needs to be noted that he didn't scold me or Phoebe at all for the same behavior. Phoebe sensed my discomfort and told them that we had to leave as we had planned. Flash forward a few weeks and Phoebe and I decide to go see Mia at work again. Richard intrudes on our conversation yet again and again he singles me out from the group, teasing me and only referring to me as trouble. This time I just play along as I can tell it isn't going to stop. He asks me if she is after another job as he needs someone to clean his home and lives all the way out where my parents and Mia live. Mia tells him she can't as she has too many responsibilities, but I tell him I might know a few people in the area that might do it and I give him my phone number. Richard takes this as a sign that I have agreed to do it and begins texting me incessantly about setting up a meeting. This man is much older than me and lives alone in a rural area. Suddenly my instincts kick in and I try to get out of it by telling him I can't drive. He says he can pick me up from the nearest train station. I don't want to come across as impolite or have my best friend's boss resent her because of me, so I make the mistake of agreeing. However, I 
tell him that my sister will be helping me as she is looking for a part-time job and my dad will be dropping me off. I do this in order to have some backup and so that my dad knows my whereabouts. Richard goes on to complain about how I don't trust him and claims that his house is very small and the hundred dollars he's going to pay me won't be enough to split with my sister. I tell him that I just want to provide her with work experience and finally he agrees asking how old she is, my sister being 17. Richard and I finally find a time that I'm not working to schedule a meeting. This meeting is held at his place of work and I feel a lot more comfortable sitting in the main restaurant surrounded by people as I thought he was going to hold the meeting in an office. We begin talking about the responsibilities of the job. He tells me it'll be basic things like tidying up, vacuuming, the usual. I agree. He then goes on to tell me he will also be expecting me to do his laundry. I think this is a bit odd as he is only paying a small amount for such a large job. He assures me his house is small and not that messy but continuously claims it just needs a woman's touch. I nod and ignore the fact that this grown man thinks that just because he is a man, it means he doesn't need to know how to maintain his own home. Now, this is where things start to get creepy. Near the end of the meeting, he asks me again how old my sister is, and when I say 17, his face drops. He then starts telling me about how he previously posted this ad on Craigslist, and this 60-year-old woman replied offering to do it in lingerie. He tells me he didn't even ask for that in the ad, but she offered and he was put off completely. He then proceeds to tell me that he would be willing to pay more to someone between the ages of 18 to 30 if they were willing to do that, but he would never request that because he's not a pervert. I call him out on this and tell him then and there that the meeting is done and I have to go meet Phoebe. He asked me if he made me uncomfortable, obviously, but I just say no and that I'll get back to him. This strange man, who I've only met three times, then attempts to hug me but I ignore the gesture and awkwardly wave goodbye from less than three feet away. I book it down the street to Phoebe's work and tell her the whole story. She tells me I can't do it and I tell her I know but I don't know how to tell them that without risking my own safety or Mia's job. Fortunately, Richard gives me the perfect out. He texts me later that afternoon telling me he hopes I'm okay with cats because he has a small one. I see this as the perfect opportunity and lie and tell him that my sister and I are both deathly allergic to cats and neither of us will be open to doing the job. Richard accepts this reasoning after a little persuasion and I think I'm finally done with him. Unfortunately, that was not the case. Richard proceeds to text me every day asking if I'm mad at him or if he made me uncomfortable asking me how my day was, etc. Just behaving like a preteen in a new relationship, basically, and the more I ignored him, the more he texted. I finally blocked him in March of 2019. This escapade had began four or five months prior to this. The blocking still didn't stop him, though. Me informed me that Richard was no longer going to be working there, as he had to go for surgery and we wouldn't have to see him anymore. See, Richard hadn't only been harassing me, but... Mia and Phoebe too, just to a lesser extent. One Saturday morning while I was working, setting up at around 7.45am, Richard showed up at my work. The divider was down as we were closed so he came and stood in the doorway, the only exit I had available to me at the time. He started asking me why I was ignoring him and telling me about his surgery. I told him he wasn't allowed to stand there as it was a fire exit but he didn't budge. Fortunately, my boss showed up shortly after and told Richard he was going to phone the security if he didn't move. Recognizing the sheer look of fear on my face, my boss was kind of a jerk on most days, but by God was I grateful for him that morning. Roughly a month after that experience, I thought Richard would be gone from my life. I was living in my new apartment, Mia was around all the time and loved her job without Richard there. Things were going well for us. One morning after a night of drinking, me and the flatmates became peckish. I decided to order us some greasy food on a food delivery app. Lo and behold, who was our delivery driver other than Richard? I turn to my boyfriend at the time and tell him he has to go collect the food. He doesn't understand, but Mia assures him it's important. He agrees and goes out to collect it. 
Richard is not driving the vehicle he claims to be driving on the app, and at first we're confused as the number plate is also different. Me and I watch from his bedroom window, and the intersection takes much longer than expected. He comes back and we ask what took him so long. He tells us that Richard refused to give him the food until he could prove that he was my boyfriend. He recognized my name from the app, and now he knew where we lived. Me and I tell my flatmates the story of what happened and we all agreed it's a good idea to go to my RA. The RA reports it to upper management and they say they can't really do anything about it but if he comes in again to call their security. A few months go by and there is no Richard sightings until I order from the same app again. Yet again, Richard is our driver and yet again in a different car. I send my boyfriend to go collect the food again and report the incident to my RA again in the food delivery app. I know I was stupid in not immediately reporting it to campus security as I had much more proof of the creepy behavior than he had of his innocence, but I was naive and I didn't want my parents to find out at the time. Fortunately, I haven't seen Richard since then. This is a story that's really been bothering me lately for absolutely no reason whatsoever. But a few months back, I just had this dream that brought back this memory I tried to suppress growing up. But as of recently, it's been weighing on my mind. Growing up in 2005 on the edge of the suburbs, there was a large grove of trees and hills by some railroad tracks that led to a big forest about half a mile from my house. When I was nine years old, me and my neighborhood friends would ride bikes to the railroad tracks and walk to the forest to go explore the random pieces of furniture and junk in this peculiar forest. We play card games, do homework, and hang with friends out there for about an hour or two, but never sat out there for too long. There were small abandoned houses here and there in this forest that we stayed away from, as one neighborhood friend, Michael, told me that there was a homeless man who lived in one of them, and if you saw him, to be sure to run. So right off the bat, after hearing this, going near this house in the woods was scary as could be. One chilly November afternoon after school, I came home and dropped off my backpack at my house and immediately went to the woods. My bike was broken, so I walked. Michael had told me at school that day to meet him in this open area of the forest to play Pokemon with him. This was something we'd frequently do growing up, just to pass the time until our parents got home at 4pm, so it was nothing unusual. As I crossed the railroad tracks into the forest, I instantly felt a weird sensation. That feeling you feel when someone is watching you. I looked all around and couldn't see anyone, so thought I was just getting spooked, as the rather overcast day was very eerie anyway. Trekking through the autumn leaves scattered across this large wooded area, I came upon the big open area where I was supposed to meet Michael. Near the area where we normally met was his notebook, open. On the page was written, Hey, I had to go back home and grab some batteries for my Game Boy. Wait for me here, I'll be back soon. Michael. And so I waited. Being alone, especially feeling like someone was watching me, made this particular moment very uncomfortable. However, I convinced myself I was just being a wuss and decided to wait for Michael. I sat down and began playing my Game Boy. It wasn't too long until that sensation of being watched grew into utter paranoia. I kept frantically looking up from my Game Boy and checking my watch to see how long I'd been waiting. I'd been sitting there for 30 minutes. It was beginning to get dark. Then, I heard some leaves crunch. I looked into the direction of the sound and briefly saw a dark hooded figure peeking from behind a few trees, hidden back behind them. My skin crawled, and I immediately jumped up from where I was sitting and froze in my tracks, staring. I screamed hello to see if anyone was there. I was quickly reminded I wasn't alone when I saw this tall, dirty looking hooded man peek back around from the trees. He called back. Hey, buddy. I picked up Michael's notebook and ran for my life. I ran so fast I barely had time to look behind me. However, I heard leaves crunching not too far behind me, and it was the man running after me. He was screaming for me to come back, 
and I just wanted to talk to you, I'm sorry. I began crying as I was running, thinking this was exactly how those missing kids disappear. I ran and ran and ran until I literally tripped over the railroad tracks and cut up my knees. Michael was just getting to the railroad tracks. He saw me, dirty and bloody and crying hysterically, and I screamed at him to run. Without question, we ran all the way home. The hooded man was nowhere to be seen once we left the railroad tracks. I last saw him standing in the woods, defeated that he couldn't catch me or something. I had no idea what was going through his mind. I told Michael everything, and we never went back to the woods ever again. Years later, in 2016, they bulldozed the woods and built a neighborhood there. We later found out from fellow neighbors who were in the area, the same thing happened to them growing up. To this day, this is probably one of the scariest stories I've ever had growing up. So I was the college student back in 2009-2010. I can't remember the exact year, but I was introduced to a friend of an acquaintance while in the cafeteria one day. He was skinny, dark-skinned, wore glasses, and kind of looked like a nerd in a pretentious, rich gangster kind of way. He usually wore button-up short sleeve shirts tucked into pants with a belt. You'd probably have to meet him to get the image. The first thing he does after introducing himself to me and chatting a bit about random things such as our goals for the future, if I remember right, is try to inundate me with all kinds of information about the Jewish Torah and how all religion is basically fake. He told me all about how the Bible and other religious books were kind of knockoffs of this and how the definitions change the meanings of everything, mostly about the different names for God or the Lord and how it pertained to different entities. I found him interesting, but at the time, I was in an atheistic phase and wasn't at all interested, but it rubbed me wrong for some reason that I couldn't really explain. Almost like cognitive dissonance. Also, I forgot to mention that the very first thing he did was introduce himself under a false name from a nation, Judea, or something very similar. We exchanged numbers and talked. One of the first things I noticed about this guy was how controlling and kind of manipulative he was. He would say things like, if you want to be my friend, you've got to be this sort of way, or you can't eat certain foods because our way of life forbids it. He really wanted me on board with his religious thing for some reason. He would offer advice and help about things too, like romantic problems. He would end up being the first person I ever truly got drunk with, which was ironically a fun time. One of the things I learned very early on about this guy was that when he wasn't harping on about religious rules and stuff like that was that he was one of the funniest people I knew. He knew how to party, how to socially connect to people, and some conversations we had were very interesting, so we became the kind of friends that talk on the phone often. But one of the other things I noticed about him was he had this very creepy Jim Jones, Charles Manson kind of ability to make people listen to him and believe the things he told them. It was very unsettling. I was well aware of his propensity towards manipulation quite early on, but for some reason, I felt obligated to hang out with him until, of course, it became a sort of friendship. My strangest friendship ever, truly. Another creepy thing about him is that he would show up when I'd least expect or want him to. I would turn my head and he'd be there. I was always super careful not to talk about him very loudly because he would do this quite often. Once when I was talking with my mom and I really didn't want to introduce him, but had to anyways. By then I already knew he was a sociopath and a narcissist. He had no empathy for anyone at all and would stroke his own ego all day long. He was incredibly vain too and took all kinds of useless supplements for no apparent reason. When we were on the phone, he would tell me things about how the different names for God aforementioned were actually about aliens. He said humans were designed to mine for gold because it would make the aliens immortal. The story he would try to sell me on would change many times over the course of our friendship, depending on what he was into. It would go from Jewish to Jamaican, then to Egyptian, then to something else I can't quite remember. Sometimes it would have elements of spirituality in it, and others he would say that after we die, that's it. 
He'd talk about how beings lived in the sun and under the moon, and how light was fake and only dark light existed. Then, he'd talk about how I should put together all of my college loan money with his so we could buy a house near the beach and we could live it up down there, like I'd fall for that. Anyways, we meet these girls and he wants to show me how easy college girls are. So he starts chatting up this girl and her friend who happens to be a lesbian. Their relationship is short-lived and it's mostly because she said he had a temper and was too controlling. She's the one who told me his real name because she saw his ID card. So this guy gets the idea that he wants to end her life and her friend for humiliating him. Apparently the ex's friend mocked him or something. He said, We don't let people do things like that to us and get away with it. So, he starts shopping around for poisons, a gun, and a knife. Anything to try to get his revenge. He talked to other people into helping him get things too. So I see this getting out of hand and the girl is a very nice girl so I do the only thing I can and tell security. But I tell them to keep me anonymous because this guy is crazy and has said many things about wanting to be a gangster and wanting to hurt people. Well... Those idiots mess that up and he ends up finding out about it. I find out from a mutual friend at some point that this guy now wants to harm me. He had plans to do so but it kind of seemed like some people either didn't come through for him or those friends weren't that into the idea. Anyway, we kind of sort of pseudo bury the hatchet. Although he did tell me many times that he could have did it himself but... He wouldn't do that because I'm his one and only true friend. I roll, but I don't doubt he would actually try to do it. I told him I was manipulated into telling on him. Long story, as you can tell the story needn't be any longer and I'm trying to just give the highlights and context. The things he said kept getting crazier and crazier though, and if you try to disagree with him, he would just get argumentative with tons of false facts or continue on. Some people actually bought this stuff and were kind of like disciples to him, but I just couldn't get behind blatant lies that a sociopath made up. At a later point, we decided to go to a beach town to hang out, drink, and have some fun. Yes, I was tempting fate, but back then I didn't care so much about my life and I really needed to get out and break free from being a shut-in that never did anything. So me, him, and two other friends went to this awesome college beach party town. It's only important to mention this because one of the friends he invited along was a guy with social issues that he didn't actually know. The guy just had money and the other guy had a car. He used these guys as a means to an end. They weren't his friends, to my surprise. At one point the guy with the car stands up in the middle of the night when the whole town goes dead. Our cell phones died and a dealer was the only hope for a ride we could get. So the dealer requests we hold something for him in exchange for a ride while he goes to get his granny's car. Charles makes me put it in my pocket after a bit. Looking back, the guy was doing everything he could to make me look even more suspicious. He had me wait in an alley. I can't remember why exactly. He said it was out of sight, but the dealer came back and said that what he was doing was messed up and then I stuck out over there in the sort of shadowy area. Looking back, if a cop drove by, they'd have detained me on the spot and then have taken whatever off of me of my person and arrested me. Eventually we leave and Charles decides that we should just keep the stuff the dealer handed him because he never came back anyway. So we were waiting by the gas station and this guy literally goes up to a police officer to ask for a ride. By this time, he had taken the stuff back and forced the other guy to hold on to it, but he had assumed that the socially awkward guy gave it back to me by then. I am sure he was trying to get me with that one at that point. Anyway, after we had made it back, things went back to how they usually go. If I haven't mentioned it, Charles was a womanizer. He didn't care who it was, he'd go for her. He'd get with women that I thought would be impossible for anyone at all to get with, like married teachers and devout churchgoers who were in committed relationships, but he also didn't seem to have standards. He just liked to ruin people's relationships and their lives. It kind of shattered my illusions of people at the time because it showed me that everyone could be manipulated in doing anything and that identity and personality didn't mean anything. I'm not sure, but I might have been depressed for a long time after that. There was this girl who was a pastor's daughter, sort of pretty, 
she kept to herself mostly. Charles decided to go out with her at some point and she entered this rebellious phase where she was sleeping around with everyone. She also didn't bathe or take care of herself. Apparently, Charles was her first. When I asked her if that was true, she proceeded to tell me horror stories about how he was manipulative and abusive toward her. And one time during a fight, while they were walking back to campus, he tried to push her into traffic. This was told to me during a period of time he had left and gone somewhere for an internship. Thankfully, I thought, because I wasn't likely to see him again, at least not for a long time. I was wrong. He came back when I least expected it, and he was just as messed up as ever. I told him I thought a girl liked me once and expressed a desire to get with her. Just random conversation that I didn't think would go anywhere. I just needed to work up the nerve to do it. Upon hearing this, he goes over to her, they talk. Next thing I know, they're in a relationship. This relationship lasts a few weeks and for some reason he's told her and everyone else that I'm his cousin. Suddenly they break up and she's avoiding both him and me. I try to explain that I'm not like him and that she doesn't need to be afraid of me but she absolutely refuses to be around me. If I sit at the table all of our friends except Charles are at, she gets up and leaves. Someone asked her about it and she told them that it was because Charles was my cousin and that he did horrible things to her when they were together. This scumbag did that stuff just because I liked her, and in a way, it was kind of my fault. Anyway, a few years later, circa 2012 or something, I have a new circle of friends. A guy named Ricky, another named Mike, and a girl named Karen. Ricky had a huge crush on Karen, but we all got along just fine. One day, Charles just shows up and tries to get Ricky to join us in our adventures, or whatever. I'm really just trying to find any excuse to distance myself at this point, but I guess at this junction of my life, I'm still way too shy to tell people off or not be afraid to speak up. This idiot has some plan to form our own gang or something, and one day he's trying to three-way call us. I badly wanted to tell Ricky that giving him his number was a terrible idea, but I didn't want to get shot or stabbed or anything. I didn't pick up the phone and apparently they had a conversation. Later on, I'd find out that during their few weeks of friendship, Charles was trying to get Ricky in on a plan to lure me into a trap to hurt me. He had sold Ricky a lie originally that I liked Karen, and Ricky didn't seem to mind and said that he would step down. So Charles started spinning other lies. Ricky didn't go for any of it in the end, and we talked and had a long, healthy conversation about it. Ricky's still a good friend to this day. Eventually, Charles left, and the last I heard from him was some voicemail from 2015 or something. Hands down, the creepiest person I'd ever met, befriended, made an enemy of, and then had to play it cool with for years on end just to not end up dying or worse. He never did admit his real name to me. He always introduced himself under false names to strangers, too. I think this story needs a lot more details, so... Feel free to ask any questions in the comments about things that didn't make any sense and I'll do my best to fill in the gaps. I really wanted to keep this short and just go over all the creepy points about my friendship with Charles. It's disturbing to me as I read the stories on this sub how many experiences I've actually had worth sharing. They aren't as terrifying as most of the other stories I read, but they're enough to still make me shiver a little in hindsight. Bear with me if it gets long. I went to college straight out of high school, so my first weekend partying on a college campus was when I was 18. I remember hearing about this one frat house in particular that was notorious for trying to drug girls during their first few weeks I was there. It's horrible, but... It seemed like everyone had a friend or knew someone who knew someone who partied at that house and woke up with no memory of it. Now I recall that was my first weekend in a new city on a new campus. There was definitely more than one frat house and I was with a decently large group of people. I felt safe. This group included me, a close friend from high school who was also my roommate, her boyfriend, his three roommates, also nice guys and another two girlfriends from high school. There may have been more that joined later in the night or something, but this was like four years ago now, so bear with me. 
Now, we were stupid enough to still go out, partying from house to house. However, there was a limit to my stupidity. We all brought our own drinks. The guys had cans of beer loaded into a few backpacks, and the girls all had mixed drinks. Let's be honest, mostly liquor and some juice, and water bottles with screw caps. We kept them on us the whole time, something that was drilled into us, I think. Make your own drink and never set it down. One house we went to had a setup that, looking back, was incredibly sketchy. The party was mostly in the unfinished basement. It had a cool underground vibe. It was pretty packed and lit up by a few black lights or red lamps. The weird thing was the drinks. There was one room in this basement that had a doorway with no actual door and an opening next to the doorway that looked like a window. It reminded me of the window lunch ladies in middle school served food out of. Well, there were a couple of coolers in this room, but rather than being open to everyone, a small handful of dudes would just hand out beers out throughout that little window. There was one senior dude who latched onto me during this party. At first I didn't care. I was with my friends and wasn't trying to hook up with anybody, but I was willing to flirt and dance a little. Harmless, I thought. I sobered up a little bit when this guy, I'm going to name him Buzz, brings me a beer. It was already open. Now luckily for me, I can't stand beer. I had my extremely strong screwdriver in my purse and didn't need a beer. Initially, that's why I didn't drink any. What pulled me out of my tipsy haze was when Buzz pipes up and goes, Are you just going to hold that beer or are you going to drink it? Right away I was annoyed. Mind your own business, creep. Maybe I'm trying to pace myself. Then I started to question on a deeper level why he was in such a hurry for me to chug this beer he had brought me. I looked at the beer for a second and then handed it to him with a huge grin on my face. He puts his hand up and shook his head. I think he said something like, No, nah, that's yours. Well, now I'm definitely not going to drink it. I didn't make a scene right away or jump to any obvious conclusions, but I started to watch a lot more closely. I made sure none of my friends were drinking the beer from the party. I think that I told them all that I felt weird about and we didn't need to leave, but please be careful here. I held the beer for a while, bringing it up to my face now and then gave the illusion that I was drinking it. Now, this guy followed me the rest of the night. We went to another party, he followed me there. We went to my friend's boyfriend's house, he followed us there. I went through periods of doubt. He was pretty good looking and he was hitting it off with our group pretty well. But towards the end of the night when he kept trying to get me in rooms alone to make out, I was sort of over it. My friend's boyfriend had to work the next morning so he stayed sober enough to drive us back to the dorms. It ended up being him, my friend, and Buzz in the car. While we were waiting for everyone to get in the car, my friend's boyfriend turns to me in the back seat and lets me know Buzz told him he was coming back to the dorms with me. It was in the space of a minute and I think I only had time to look confused and be like, um, no? During the car ride, it became apparent that my friend was riding along to make sure I got back alright, but she was going to stay at her boyfriend's house. When we pulled up at the dorms, there's pretty much nobody around. It's easily three to four in the morning. I get out of the car and before anyone can say anything, Buzz follows. I remember being salty when her boyfriend just drove off, like, wow dude, thanks for taking the hint, way to look out. We got to the brightly lit lobby of the dorms and I turned around to face him. I asked what he was planning on doing. He looked a little bit stunned and was like, well... Do you want me to come up? I gave him a blunt nope and watched with satisfaction as he had to wander back out into the night to find his way home. I probably should have ditched him earlier in the night. I shouldn't have given him so many openings to be alone with me, but honestly, I had my own agenda. The way I see it, he wasted his time with me all night, waiting for me to lose my bearings. That never happened. I like to think I kept him busy and maybe spared another girl. When I was about 11 or 12 years old, my cat had a litter of kittens and I was trying to give them away at my local park. Around the same time is when I started to wear sports bras. I was prepubescent and getting used to being a big girl and 
thought it was kind of neat to be growing up. Either way, being new to sports bras, I found I could use it as a large pocket of sorts. I had taken three kittens to the park, and I had given away two kittens while I was there. So naturally, with only one kitten left, I put it in my newly acquired pocket for the three-block journey through the neighborhood back home. Now, I wasn't supposed to be back home for at least another hour, as I didn't have to be home until the streetlights came on and the sun was a ways from setting. I was about halfway home and only needed to make one more turn and walk up the road to my house when a man in a white truck pulled up and asked what I was doing. I knew not to talk to strangers, it was drilled into my head at a young age, but I didn't find it weird because I lived in a pretty small town in Utah where everyone knew everyone and it wasn't strange to be stopped by someone who looked somewhat familiar because they would usually just ask how my parents were or they would make sure the younger kids in town were okay. So even though I didn't recognize him, I thought he could be my parents' friend. He leaned over the open truck window as I walked closer and said, What do you got in your shirt? Me being an innocent child and not understanding that question as a no-go, I stayed standing close to the truck door and simply said, A kitten? And continued to explain that my cat had babies. At this point, he pulled my shirt away from my chest at the neckline and said, I'm just going to peek at the kitty, and looked on my shirt. Alarm bells started going off. Even though I did notice the remark about what was in my shirt, I definitely knew he shouldn't be looking down my shirt. I started to back away, and he reached out and grabbed my wrist. My gut twisted as I realized I couldn't get away. He started to drag me closer to the truck door as he opened the door stepped out and grabbed my wrist again. But now, there wasn't a metal door between us. It was at this time, I went into full panic mode trying to get away, trying to bite and kick, but I was too scared to scream. Just a second later, I hear screeching tires and at the corner just ahead of us, and I see another truck that is doing at least 50 miles per hour in this small neighborhood ripping around a corner. It was my dad. He stopped just inches away from the front of this strange man's truck and jumped out of the truck, his face red and fists ready to beat the life out of this guy, and he screams, What are you doing? The man cowers and says, I, I was just looking at her. I, I, I was just talking about... D d d I was about to take the kitten. My dad physically lifted this man by his shirt and threw him back in his truck and goes on to beat the life out of him. But I grabbed his shirt, me now sobbing and begging to go home. He relents, but warns this man that if he ever sees him in our town again, he would be a walking dead man. He drives the whole seconds it took to get home with me still sobbing in his lap while holding this shaking kitten. When we get home, my mom gets on the phone with the police and goes over the little details that my dad had obtained. I got a stern talking to about strangers and what to do on those situations, and that was the end of it. The police were never able to find him, and no one around our town knew who he was, so I think he might have just been passing through the town, or may have even been a prowler from another town. And here we are, almost two decades later, and I asked my dad how he knew to come up that street like a demon escaping from Hades. He said that he was just sitting on the couch with my mom and had a gut feeling that something was horribly wrong and jumped in the truck and drove. Apparently my mom was so shocked by my dad's weird intuition out of nowhere that she didn't even have enough time to follow him outside before he was already driving off. I'm so grateful that my dad followed his gut and found me so quickly because I believe that if he was a few moments later, I would have been in that predator's truck and I don't even want to think about what would have happened then. These experiences took place one year after high school, and that was a while ago, so some memories are fuzzy. I, an 18-year-old female, was still living at home with my dad. I paid rent and worked full-time at a grocery store. My stalker... We'll call him Dave, he was also 18, was my emotionally abusive boyfriend at the time. He would constantly state how embarrassed he was of my looks and weight, 
and then flip the narrative and say how miserable he would be if I left him. He would try to pressure me to cut ties with my family and would pout when I declined. I was no shrinking violet and eventually grew tired of the emotional manipulation. My first experience happened while my dad was asleep for his night shift. Dave was at my house trying to pick a fight with me about not moving in with him. Something about that day woke me up and I told him, I'm not doing this anymore. We're not good for each other and I want to be happy. Dave lost it. He started crying and when he realized that it wouldn't work, he kept trying to persuade me to stay with him. I told him no, that we could remain friends, wrong thing to say, and that he needed to leave. He left, or so I thought. Thirty minutes later, I was making pancakes in the kitchen and I heard my brother's dog, Paco, growling from under the porch. It was a deep growl and I could tell something was off. I opened the door to find Dave hiding on the corner of my porch. He then bulldozed himself back into the house and told me he refused to leave until I was back with him. I began to panic. I didn't want to wake my dad up because I thought I could handle the situation myself. I wasn't easily intimidated by men and was raised by a bunch of rowdy farmers. I told him I needed to use the bathroom. I grabbed my phone and sped walked into the bathroom and texted one of my guy friends, Chris, and explained that I needed help. Thank God for Chris. He dropped everything and drove over as fast as he could while I was stuck in the living room with Dave telling me we'll be moving in together. It was like nothing I said mattered. Chris walked in and told him to leave now or he'd be calling the police. Dave was cowering and booked it, saying he'd text me later. Now the second experience, this happened a week or so after I broke up with Dave, the stalker. I was on my way to work when I noticed my neighbor's car was following me all the way into town. I live in a rural area so it takes a good 30 minutes to get into town. Once I parked, my neighbor, Sally, parked her car and started waving her hands and yelling. I walked over to her, clearly confused. Maybe something was wrong with my car. She ran over and said, That green truck has been following you. She pointed across the parking lot and sure enough, there was Dave in his pickup. Sally began to tell me she saw his truck parked by her house out of view from the main road and she noticed he'd leave when I'd left. Sally said she saw it happen about three times and she wanted me to know. She told me to call the police and hug me and began yelling obscenities at Dave to leave me alone. I was shaking and thanked her and went in to clock in for my shift. I came out from my first break hours later and noticed he was still parked there. I wasn't scared. I was furious. I did one of the dumbest things one can do in this situation. I stomped over to his truck and pulled his door open and began yelling at him to leave me alone and if he doesn't, I'd whoop him. He laughed. Now some backstory, I'm a tall Amazonian of a woman and have been known to be a nasty scrapper when it came to fighting. No matter how intimidating or angry I was, nothing I said was getting through to him. When he laughed, that's when the hairs of my neck stood up and I left his pickup and went back to work. I explained to a coworker what was going on and he helped me to my car once my shift was over. Dave continued to stalk me for a good few months and I kept myself surrounded by my friends with a taser. I eventually came out and told my dad. He was upset I didn't tell him earlier and he tightened security around the house as a result. I never did call the cops. Dave's stepdad was in the force and being in a small town that gave Dave more leverage to go about with no consequences. I was finally able to shake him from stalking me when I got a new boyfriend, now husband, but well, that's a whole other story. My neighbor and friend were very helpful and knowing what I know now, if I wasn't warned by my neighbor or my friend decided not to answer my texts, I probably would have been in a whole different situation. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. 
And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, always finger the apples.